Yes, a very, please. Yes, yes, thank you. A very good evening to all of you. And here we are yet again with another program of uh, uh, Sankal. My heartfelt gratitude to Dr. Vishikesh Pai, the president of Foxy, and Dr. Lakshmi Srikhande, the current chairperson of ICOG, and also to Dr. Madhuri Patel, the secretary general of Foxy, for giving us the opportunity as a governing council member to be the convener for this uh, family planning webinar series, which we have labeled as Sankal, meaning determination to bring forward, uh, you know, uh, in detail, all practical uh, nuances and uh, the, the strength to prescribe contraception to increase the um, coverage of unmet need amongst our women and to, to kind of enhance the knowledge of all ICOGNs uh, regarding the current perspectives of uh, contraception, prescription, the safety profile, etc. So thank you very much for the opportunity given. Can I have the um, series, please, uh, to begin with? Uh, let me just bring forward the uh, few details of the chairperson of ICOG. This is the program that we have today. Yes, please, next. Next, please. I think I am familiar to all. Um, and Dr. Lakshmi Srikhande, the chairperson of ICOG, she has given us tremendous encouragement to come forward and put uh, our thoughts into action by designing these webinars. She is the national corresponding editor journal of OBGYN of, uh, of Jogi and uh, the national corresponding secretary for Association of Medical Women India. Founder, patron, and president Isopar Vidharva chapter as well. And she's currently the chairperson of IMS Education Committee. Um, the president of Association of Medical Women, Nagpur AMWN 21 to 24, and has been richly decorated several awards to her credit, including the Bharat Excellence Award for Women's Health, and also the committee award, the best committee, Mehru Dhara Hansotia Award. Uh, because of the way she served the HIV AIDS committee of Foxy. Um, I, I now request you, uh, Dr. Lakshmi, to say a few words in encouragement because we have an array of speakers and very good topics today for adolescent reproductive health. So I would like your thoughts on the subject and about the speakers. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Shobha. At the outset, I want to place my sincere gratitude to our COXI president, Dr. Rishikesh Pai, and Secretary General, Dr. Madhuri Patel, for their constant support and encouragement for all our ICUG activities. And I'm so happy that as a convener, Dr. Shobha Gudi is coming out with dedicated modules on family planning month after month in the banner of Sankalp webinar on family planning. And I'm so happy, Dr. Shoga, that today you have brought out a module on reproductive health for teenagers, where we are covering three major, rather common problems of these teenagers, that is abnormal uterine bleeding, PCOS, and contraception. And the three great speakers who will be covering these three topics are Dr. Charmila, Dr. Pratik, and our vice chair, Dr. Parag Biniwale. And the chairpersons will be Dr. Mala, Vidya, Kiran, Abharani Sinha. And I'm so happy that all governing council members are uh, the faculties and speakers and chairpersons are from the governing council. And I take this opportunity to welcome Dr. Parag, who is our vice chair, secretary, Dr. Ashok Kumar, and convener. We always forget Dr. Shobha. My sincere gratitude to you as a convener for taking your time out and coming out with this module on Sankalp webinar for family planning. And I take this opportunity to welcome all dear delegates who have logged in for today's webinar on reproductive health for teenagers. So I hand over back to Dr. Shobha Gudi for further proceedings. To mute over you, Shobha. As a leader, you have really brought out the best in each one of us. Thank you for that. And thank you for being there for us as a moral support for every program we do. It is really so rare to see 
uh, uh, the chair or the president being there throughout. So we are very, very grateful to you for that. So then uh, it is now my duty to introduce the chairpersons uh, to the first session. And um, can I have their uh, CVs, please? Uh, my uh, dear friends, both of them very dear to me. Yeah, Dr. Mala Srivastava from Delhi, from the capital. And she really is a capital friend and a governing council member. Uh, she is a very proficient surgeon, head of gynae oncology unit at the, and senior consultant and professor at GRIP MER, that is Sri Gangaram Hospital, and uh, vice president elect for Isopar there and the past president of AOGD. And uh, that is when we, uh, we, we really worked very hard together to bring up a good conference with, with Maritva. Uh, of course, uh, she has. Her area of interest is known to everybody. She's a robotic surgeon, very few robotic surgeons and uh, women surgeons in the country. She's one of them and richly decorated uh, APJ Abdul Kalam Excellence Award and other awards. So I welcome you, Dr. Mala Shivasta. Thank you for being here. Next, I have the pleasure and privilege of introducing Dr. Vidya Thobi, the brand new president of the state organization, Kasoga a former chairperson of Food, Drugs and Medical Surgical Equipment Committee, where she also won the Best Committee Foxy Award, Dr. Nehru Dhara Hansotia, very richly deserved Vidya. And uh, she is uh, co-ICOG governing council member with me. And um, she has been, uh, you know, organizing conferences in the past, has done the previous Kasoga in 2016, has published really richly, and um, has is a, is a very good orator. Thank you, Vidya, for being here. I hope you have joined because I had no opportunity to check that out. So thank you for being here, Vidya, today. So now I request both the chairpersons to take forward the session. Dr. Mala, please do the honors and introduce Dr. Charmila. And then I request Dr. Vidya Tobi to introduce Dr. Pratik and take forward the interaction and discussion. Thank you so much. Thanks, Dr. Shobha, for your kind introduction and having given me this opportunity to be a part of this nice program dedicated to the teenagers. It's, and I also thank Dr. Lakshmi, Madam, for having all of us together and being a part of the academic activities that are going on. And it's my pleasure and privilege to introduce the first speaker of the day, Dr. Charmila. She is the Vice President-elect Foxy 2024, Chairperson of Clinical Research Committee, of Foxy, she has she's also the ICOG governing council member, national coordinator UNICEF Foxy, national coordinator Medha Foxy PG program, national coordinator Isar Gurukul program, and she has many many laurels to her credit. We are waiting to hear from you, Dr. Charmila, your scientific deliberation on management of AUB through hormones. Thank Over you so much, Mala Ma'am, for the kind introduction. I would like to thank Dr. Lakshmi and Dr. Swabhagudi Madam for the opportunity. Um, Madam had asked me to talk on uh, the management of adolescent uh, AUB and the optimal use of hormones for that. We need to remember that uh, uh, AUB in an adolescent is quite common. Uh, menstrual disorders and abnormal uterine bleeding are among the most frequent complaints in adolescents. And when you want to name it as AUB, it is like excessive bleeding or a bleeding which occurs outside of the normal cycle of menstruation. Then it is labeled as abnormal uterine bleeding. The, when, it, when you want to define heavy menstrual bleeding, it is excessive menstrual loss, blood loss that interferes with the women's physical, social, emo emotional, or material quality of life. And then it's called as heavy menstrual bleeding, which is because it is affecting the quality of life. The causes may be a genital cause. It can be a non-genital tract disease. It can be a systemic disorder. It can be because of medications, which the adolescent is using. But we have to remember that anovulatory uterine bleeding is the primary cause of abnormal uterine bleeding in an adolescent. And usually it resolves with maturation of the hypothalamic pituitary ovarian axis as a child becomes older. When you want to know the systemic causes in an adolescent, it may be a chronic disease. It may be coagulation disorders. It can be because the child is undergoing chemotherapy or has undergone a solid organ or a chemopoietic stem cell transplantation. 
and that can contribute contribute to an abnormal uterine bleeding pattern in an adolescent. Uh, when we uh, in, in, in the men, the menstrual cycle in adolescence is typically anovulatory and it may be irregular uh, all the time. And it uh, when it occurs as a cycle, it is usually happens once in twenty one to forty five days, and it can be lasting for almost seven days. And that's opinion of the American College in two thousand fifteen. So. It, it's not like an reproductive age women or an adult where the cycle is much more different. Here it will be between 21 to 45 days and it can last for even seven days. And there's one condition which contributes to an increased uh, uh, rate of um, uh, anovulatory ble bleeding and that is uh, adolescent polycystic ovarian syndrome patient. It is one of the most common endocrinopathy in red reproductive age women and it affects almost 3.6 to 15% of the population. But actually there are no studies available in the adolescent age group. Uh, Pratik will be taking care of the management of adolescent PCOS. Uh, when you want to label up adolescent as PCOS, you have to remember that a uh, lots of caution is needed because menstrual irregularity can happen in an adolescent who does not have a polycystic ovarian disease. Hyperandrogenism can happen in both an adolescent as well as an adolescent who is having PCOS. There can be an ultrasound picture of polycystic ovaries in both. So when you want to label an adolescent as PCOS, you have to use extreme caution before you label them as polycystic ovarian disease. And how do you differentiate between abnormal pattern and a normal menstrual cycle pattern in the years immediately after puberty? Uh, the, the time uh, from menarche is less than one year and the girl has got irregular cycles, you have to take it as a normal pubertal transition. When it happens more than a year post menarche, uh, post puberty, there has to be a cycle which is almost like more than 90 days in that particular year. Any one cycle more than 90 days, then it becomes an irregular pattern one to three years post menarchal period, suppose she's got the cycle which is less than 21 or it's more than 45, then also it's an irregular cycle. Three years post menarche, if she has got a cycle which is less than 21 or more than 35 now, it's not 45, 35, or she's got less than eight cycles per year, then it becomes an irregular cycle. Or she has not attained menarche till the age of 15 years, or she's attained telarchy, but it's almost three years since she's attained telarchy and she's still not menstruated then it becomes an irregular pattern of menstruation. How do you screen to, un, uh, to identify the underlying cause of uh, heavy menstrual bleeding in an adolescent? Uh, history of the menstrual uh, period is very, very important. And any other factors that suggest a bleeding disorder like von Willebrand's disease have to be elicited from the girl. And you have to ask for signs which is not able to explain properly whether she's got a heavy flow regarding soaking of her blood sheet, bed sheets. And suppose she bleeds through a pad or a tampoon in two hours or less, that also means she has got a heavy menstrual bleeding. And when heavy menstrual bleeding has started, even at menarche, it needs, you need to have to rule out a bleeding disorder like von Willebrand's disease, or sometimes even platelet function disorders, thrombocytopenia and clotting factor deficiency. Because uh, from menarche, she has got irregular heavy flow, but not irregular, heavy flow, it points towards a coagulation disorder. And when you want to assess uh, an adolescent when she has got heavy menstrual bleeding, the initial assessment should be for the hemodynamic stability. And you need to rule out pregnancy and bleeding disorder with lab investigations. And suppose you are eliciting a history of sexual activity, then you need to test for sexually transmitted infections. And you have to consider testing for the underlying cause of anovulation if you think it's anovulatory bleed. The next decision will be the, whether you, you need to admit the girl and then evaluate her and manage her. That should be the a last point in your decision tree. Admission is needed for adolescents who are hemodynamically, uh, hemodynamically unstable or they've got an active bleeding which is so heavy that she needs to be hospitalized for management. And how do you modify the evaluation in adolescent? How it is different from an adult uh, woman? It is actually, uh, you need not do a speculum examination typically uh, to rule out a cause uh, for heavy menstrual bleeding in an uh, adolescent and that's an American College Committee opinion. And when do you want to do an ultrasound for an adolescent? It's usually not needed because the structural causes of heavy menstrual bleeding are quite rare in teens. The palm, cause, palm causes are quite uh, rare. It's actually the coin which causes the bleed in uh, teens. So a pelvic ultrasound is not routinely indicated. But if you think it's needed, it's better if you do a transabdominal ultrasound rather than a transvaginal ultrasound. And how do you manage acute heavy menstrual bleeding in an adolescent? Hormonal management is the mainstay of treatment. Suppose there are no contraindications to estrogen, you can give intravenous conjugated estrogen every four to six hours. And, uh, and once she stops bleeding, you can switch over to OC pills. Or you can even start with a monophasic combined 
oral contraceptive pills, which contains a 30 to 50 microgram ethanol estradiol formulation. And it has to be given once in six to eight hours till the bleeding stops. And you can actually try tronexamic acid or amino coproic acid in oral and intravenous form, according to the American College, to stop bleeding in adolescent age, heavy menstrual bleeding. But what about the problems with the oral contraceptive taper, which is advocated for acute heavy menstrual bleeding? The tolerance to the high dose uh, oral contraceptives is quite a problem. And that's why a high dose progesterone will be much better, followed by tapering dose, which is much better tolerated by adolescents. You have to remember that if you have started therapy with hormones and then you want to check for bleeding disorders, the interpretation of the coagulation studies as well as the von Willebrand factor will be less accurate. And that's why you need to investigate before you start them on oral contraceptive pills. And uh, when you have an acute bleed, other than OC pills, you can go for progesterone therapy, which is much better tolerated. And the drug you give is either medroxyprogesterone acetate, uh, 10 to 20, 20 milligram twice daily, or norethindrone, 5 milligram twice daily. That has to be continued for three weeks and then tapered to once daily after actually after a week. The whole dose has to be continued for three weeks, but you can taper the dose to once daily after seven to 10 days when the bleeding has reduced and that the lower dose can be continued for the rest of the two weeks. But you have to remember that progesterones can work only if the endometrium is more than four to five millimeters. So if, the, if a girl is bled for a longer period of time, you may need an ultrasound for endometrial thickness before you start her on progesterone therapy. And how do you prevent uh, re repeated cycles of anovulatory bleeding? Cyclical progesterone therapy, that is metroxyprogesterone acetate, 10 milligram per day, for 10 to 14 days in each month can be given for an orderly, predictable, self-limiting withdrawal bleed in such oligomenoric uh, anovulatory period girls. Uh, but please avoid the treatment with a depot preparation of depot metroxyprogesterone acetate because uh, it cannot be withdrawn. And if it's unsuccessful in uh, acute bleeding, its effects are very difficult to overcome. And the errors which we follow in management of heavy menstrual bleeding in an adolescent is the traditional dosing of giving one OC pill per day regime will not work in heavy bleeding, especially in anovulatory bleeding. It's not sufficient at all. To remember that the pathophysiology of anovulatory bleeding is a uh, presence of an excessively proliferated or a disordered proliferative endometrium, which will not respond to a single dose regime. That's why you need high dose hormonal therapy to produce a stoppage of anovulatory bleeding initially. And once the bleeding is stopped or reduced, then you taper and then you stop so that you, she has a withdrawal bleed for the thickened endometrium. And the maintenance after management of heavy menstrual bleeding is also mandatory. There you can give once a daily pill or progesterone or OC pills, which can be given either continuously, remembering that breakthrough bleeding may still occur when you give her once daily pill, or you can give progesterone and allow her for a withdrawal bleeding on a periodic basis. The other errors which we do when you're managing adolescent heavy menstrual bleeding is uh, we fail to initiate oral ion therapy after an acute bleeding episode. And we also fail to monitor for problems with adherence to oral iron uh, with adolescents per, per se. And can you combine OC pills with tranexamic acid? There's a theoretical risk of uh, increased risk of thrombosis. But the American College Committee opinion says that the data are quite sparse regarding thrombosis. And these drugs can be used concomitantly when other therapies have been insufficient to control the bleeding. And what are the non-medical op options in uh, adolescents? Uh, that has to be the last resort. You can put an intrauterine Foley's catheter, or you can do a suction evacuation of the intrauterine clots with the distal clots cast, which is quite rare, uh, which is not done routinely. But if you're doing it under anesthesia for a, putting a catheter or a suction evacuation, you can consider putting a leave or just intrauterine device, even in adolescents, to prevent an on, uh, to help her in an ongoing therapy for her heavy menstrual bleeding. And in PCOS, the progesterone withdrawal bleed or a combined oral contraceptive therapy is needed. And that's a first line therapy for the management of menstrual irregularities. But if there's no improvement of menstrual irregularity with combined oral contraceptives or they're not tolerated, you can add uh, insulin sensitizers as metformin without the progesterogens. It may be controversial, uh, but it may be helpful in a group of adolescent heavy menstrual bleeding. And with the special issues regarding combined oral contraceptive use in adolescents, we have to remember Always use low dose pills, do not go for the higher dose pills in adolescents. And between the ages of 12 to 16, you have to be a little careful and you need to use them only for a short period of time for withdrawal bleed. That is, you can use it for seven days or four cycles per year for menstrual regularity. It's not needed that she has to menstruate uh, very regularly every month. You can give her four cycles per year uh, to have a proper bleed. 
But after the age of 16, if you know, low, low dose OC pills for the traditional regime of 21 days. And what are the problems which are uh, which have been usage of oral contraceptive pills in an adolescent? They say that the peak bone mass development, which happens during adolescence and in containing oral contraceptive pills are used. Uh, but many studies also refute this observation. So there's no clarity on that. But as no con definitive conclusions are available, it's better that we use it with caution. And please avoid as much as possible the use of oral contraceptives within two years of menarche or in patients who are less than 14 years of age unless it is clinically warranted. And in the adolescent, uh, remember to use uh, the combination with drospirinone and uh, levomifolate, norgestimate and norethindrone, which seem to be much better compared to the traditional uh, drugs containing levonorgestrel and desogestrin. Thank you so much for your patience. Thanks, Dr. Charmila. That was really very exhaustive and informative scientific deliberation from your side. I just wanted to add one point. Nowadays, we are getting adolescents who have been repeatedly taking eye pills and then they are going into irregular bleeding. Not knowingly, if you take the history, uh, if you keep, uh, be persistent with their history, then they will come out with the things that they have been taking eye pill irregularly. That is one thing, one history we have to elicit from our youngsters. And another thing, we have to also rule out pregnancy complications in these. Sometimes maybe they are not knowing or maybe they are not aware or they do not want to disclose. They may come up with something like incomplete abortions and all that. So I just thought I must add these two points. Uh, that's why your counseling is very important when you talk to an adolescent yeah. woman, to take a proper history, uh, yeah. you give her give her that confidentiality, talk to her in private, away from the parents, uh, we're explaining to the parents that it's needed in some girls and sometimes we see when you put an ultrasound, you think there's something wrong and you produce, you'll see gestational sacs also, that also yeah. come across without them giving any history of taking any pills also. So I think it uh, yeah, our experience uh, helps us to uh, see like which patient needs to be talked in that particular manner to elicit the correct history. Yeah, yeah. many Thank of uh, Dr. Mala, many of these youngsters are sexually active. Yes, that's and what I'm sometimes saying. Sometimes we are also so much biased that she's just 14 mm -hmm. years of age or 15 mm -hmm. years of age mm -hmm. and we never bother mm -hmm. to ask her. So as Charmila is saying, yes, they should be asked history in private, in person, but whenever in doubt, I suggest and I do in my practice urine pregnancy tests without telling them because telling them. we have to rule out pregnancy at any cost because I have seen ectopic pregnancy in 15 years of a girl. I have seen intrauterine pregnancies, incomplete abortions. So the pregnancy and its related complication should be there oh, in the differential diagnosis of adolescent AUB in India also. Yes, yes, very much, very much. True in our practice. Yes. Very, uh, I, I really agree with Dr. Lakshmi that once there is, there is a uh, sexual debut, then adolescents can be uh, kind of, you know, should not use such words that they can be very voracious about it. And uh, sex is bar bar, but there is no contraception. So uh, that is what, there is absolutely no protection against infection and um, pregnancy. So, that is there. But I, I really appreciate Dr. Charmila's talk for uh, two reasons. I think she brought out the, the use of uh, hormones in, a, in all its details. And by yeah, yeah. By actually, yeah, yeah. It, is, it has started again. Yeah. The other thing she brought out, adolescent anemia. And I'm very grateful to her for that because I think anemia is something you have to address it at a very young age and they need to understand and take responsibility for building their own hemoglobin and taking good care. So thank you, Charmila. So thank, thank you, you so very much. Dr. Sorry. Mala, Dr. Vidya, please continue the discussion and introduce yeah, the yeah. speakers. Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, inviting me as a chairperson uh, for this important uh, topic. And I welcome Dr. Pratik Tambe here. Uh, can I have his CV, please? And uh, we all know Dr. Pratik Tambe uh, is very renowned uh, speaker, sought after. And uh, we also know 
screen is there any problem with connectivity uh, with yeah or it is me or net is unstable yeah yeah uh, Commitment. Yeah, if you can switch off the video, the, maybe it will improve. How much he has? CV runs in pages. So, at present, logic committee chair. Oh, is it? I have logged in from my mobile. Maybe that is the reason. Yeah. Shobha, now you are audible. Yeah. Yeah. But you are audible yeah, yeah. well now. Now you are audible. Yes. But now I have made my video off. That's why I think yes, I'm audible. Yes, yes. So it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Pratik Tambe. He's an ART consultant and gynae endoscopic surgeon. And we all know uh, for his so many credentials at his credit. At present, he's a chairperson amongst endocrinology committee and also a governing council member of ICUG. So he will be talking uh, to us about the PCOS and its treatments in treatment in adolescent. We all know that the treatment for PCOS in adolescent is primarily symptomatic and directed at the major clinical manifestation. Usually they are abnormal uterine bleeding, menstrual irregularity or uh, excessive bleeding, or it might be due to uh, cutaneous hyperandrogenism the patient presents with, or obesity and insulin resistance. So these are the three things we aim at and uh, tackling adolescent PCOS with hormones is the topic on which Dr. Pratik Tambe is going to deliberate and express his views. So over to Dr. Pratik Tambe. Thank you, respected Dr. Vidya Tobi. Congratulations again for being installed as president of Kasoka. Thank you for that very thank kind you. Thank you very introduction. Much. It's always a pleasure and a privilege to be part of the FOXI ICUJ activities. I think I was there in one of the previous events which Dr. Shobha Gudi had put together under the Sankalp banner. And again, yesterday when she called me and asked me to speak on adolescent PCOS, so yes, absolutely fine. And only thing is that I'm here at the clinic. Sometimes the internet here can be a little unstable. You had an excellent talk. Just for me from Dr. Charmila, who spoke on the use of hormones in adolescent AUD. Some part of my talk may overlap with these slides. I'll try and skip over those when I'm talking about tackling adolescent PCOS with hormones. And uh, I'd like to start with quotation. Today's quotation is from the eminent British author Somerset Mom, who said that is it, it is an illusion that youth is happy. It's an illusion only for those people who have lost it. And the adolescents know what sort of life they have. This is a very old slide, a boring slide. I don't like this slide, but unfortunately, I don't have more recent data than this. We wanted to have the census, but because of the pandemic, the census could not be completed, and therefore, we don't have updated figures. So these are the old figures that I need to quote regarding the incidence of PCOS can be as high as 26% globally. And specifically to today's context, up to one in three girls have PCOS that they are in their adolescents when you consider the Indian population. This, of course, reflects our diet, nutrition, the westernization of our civilization, a sedentary push-button lifestyle, addiction to smartphones, always being in that smartphone glare, and having your entire melatonin and your hormones disturbed. This, of course, is something which we are seeing more and more over the past two to three years. And we'll come to each of these issues in the next 15 to 20 minutes. We know that the HRA guideline was published in 2018. The updated version of the guideline is expected anytime now. So as in when that comes in, we'll have better recommendations and more updated recommendations from the various studies published all over the world and a proper meta-analysis which has been conducted as part of the HA guideline. There are also two other excellent articles which I have referred to while preparing this talk. One of these is from the USA, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and from New York, PCOS in Adolescent Girls, and this was published in 2019. There's also a wonderful article by Penya et al, which was published in DNC Medicine in March of 2020. And this has some really excellent recommendations, which we will come to in due course of time. But let's start with the absolute basics. How do you diagnose PCOS in teens? Now, this is something which is very controversial. And I wanted to touch upon this briefly before we go into the actual management. 
because whenever we discuss this in clinical coda, especially in the interiors, there seems to be a lot of confusion as to how you diagnose it. Historically, of course, these are the criteria as they were laid down earlier, but these are for adult PCOS. I'm not going to bore you by reading out this slide. All of you are aware of how the criteria have evolved over the period of past 20 to 25 years. Pratik, uh, just a moment, Pratik. One of the audience says that the audio is not very clear. To me, it is okay. Can okay. the host look into it? Shoba, it is very much clear. It is very much clear. Yeah, yeah. Pratik, please yeah, go it on. is clear. Please go, on. please go on. Please go. Okay. So, as far as the diagnostic criteria are concerned for adolescent and adult PCOS, we need to be aware that there are certain tests which are prescribed for adults, which obviously cannot be done in adolescents. And that specifically is what is highlighted in the red on that slide. The pelvic ultrasound, which is used, the transvaginal ultrasound, which is recommended by the HK guideline for diagnosis of polycystic ovary morphology or PCOM, as it's now called, is not mandatory in adolescents. Obviously, this means that in a country like India, where it would be against all social norms, it would not be culturally acceptable to do a transvaginal scan or an adolescent. We are safe from all these issues. And therefore, we look at clinical and biochemical hyperandrogenism with or without other issues such as cytotic irregularity. And diagnostic criteria, as we said, for adolescents do not take the transvaginal ultrasound criteria to effect. Also, we need to be aware that adolescents have something called as multicystic ovaries, and these may masquerade as polycystic ovaries, especially if you do a transabdominal scan. And therefore, the diagnosis of PCOS should be made with caution in this particular age group. And I just put up that slide regarding the actual ultrasound criteria for your reference, but these are not to be followed for adolescent population. The most common clinical presentations, as already described, irregular cycle, we had a lovely talk by Charmella on how the faculties, there's also acne or cytogen. Obesity is coming more and more to the fore, and mental health issues is something which we rarely talk about. In our scientific meetings, I will talk about this towards the end of my presentation. And of course, you can have reading combinations of all of these. Now, whether we should be doing biochemical assessments or not, typically in an adult patient, I would do these biochemical tests, that is total in free testosterone or SHBG levels, only if I was suspecting uh, hyperandrogenism of non-PCO origin, which means that all androgen excess is not necessarily equivalent to PCOS. If you are suspecting an adrenal tumor or an ovarian tumor or some other causes, exogenous testosterone or some other issues where like congenital tumor, hypoplasia, you can have androgen excess, which is not necessary in the tissue, then I would do these tests. In the adolescent, whether we should do them or not, the guideline is not very clear. Ideally, we would like to do it at least once to ensure that we are not missing anything, like a late presentation of congenital adrenal hypoplasia before we label this young girl as PCOS. Again, how do we diagnose and treat patients now? And this is the important part of the talk. And then with the preamble, I want to focus on the treatment, which is what the talk is supposed to be about. So let's talk about each of these clinical issues in turn. The first of these is irregular cycles. Part of this has already been covered by Charmila. And here briefly, I just want to mention that lifestyle modification should be one of the things that we talk about for these youngsters, especially when they have a lot of smartphone addiction, they're very involved in their Facebook and their Instagram and their Snapchat. And therefore, a little bit of physical activity never harmed anybody. In fact, it's very beneficial. So smart goals, 5 to 10% of weight loss is what we typically recommend. And about 120 minutes per week of moderate intensity and 115 minutes for high intensity in case you're trying to lose weight. These are the way we're supposed to counsel our patients. Typically, your teenagers are not going to understand this. So you just say, get one of these nice new devices called smartphone apps or your smartwatches, and they will help you to maintain some records of your physical activity. And then for physical activity, you always say is one of the best insulin sensitizers. It's something which is difficult to sustain in the long term, but something which is highly recommended for all patients who have a suspected diagnosis of 
PCOS. The clear treatment as far as the guidelines are concerned is that we give only progesterone withdrawal weeks, especially if the patient is in two to three years post menarche And it's absolutely fine to just get three or four periods in a year. She has to be counseled that there's nothing wrong with her body. She doesn't necessarily have to take pharmacotherapy to correct it. And that's something which is absolutely okay. However, if she insists on having the regular periods, then of course, in this particular subset of patients, oral contraceptives or cyclical hormone therapy, as we call it, would be very much beneficial. But that is something which we will need to sit down with the patient, the caregivers, the parents, family, and then make a joint decision regarding the advantages and disadvantages of these drugs. The HRA guideline says that as far as adolescents are concerned, the COC should be considered in patients who have a clear diagnosis of PCOS and also can be considered in patients who are deemed at risk but do not fulfill all the criteria for a diagnosis of adolescent PCOS. The next step is to talk a little bit about acne and hirsutism. As far as clinical assessment is concerned, we need to have a good history. We obviously need to look at the patient, which means that you have to observe her properly and look at nine different areas. And that's where your perimen gorilla score comes in. There's also something called as Ludwig score for alopecia, but we won't talk about that today because it's not very commonly seen in the adolescent population. So these are your nine different areas where you look at your hair growth. This is the treatment algorithm. The first step always is to ensure that this excess hair growth is of PCO origin. It is not a non-PCO hyperantigen. The next step is to ensure that you give some clear pointers as to how you are going to treat this patient going forward, and then finally you suggest your pharmacotherapy. So the basic tenets of pharmacotherapy here in this particular patient specifically for this age group, is that we need to sit them down, explain to them, counsel to them, counsel them that a multidisciplinary team approach is required. <coughs> Excuse me. The existing hair growth needs a cosmetologist or a dermatologist to for it. Preventing new hair growth is something which you and I can definitely do. That's part of the treatment that we offer, but it's a long-term therapy needs to be done for at least 6 to 12 months because that's the cycle of hair growth, a minimum of 90 days to 120 days. If this is refractory, then you would need to look at this patient again. You would need to revisit with a fresh pair of eyes with a different perspective, maybe refer her to an andrologist and then that endocrinologist or andrologist, I'm sorry, did I say andrologist? So an endocrinologist and second line anti-androgens would be considered. And these specifically are finasteride, glutamide, and spironolactone. Spironolactone is not safe in the first trimester. Pregnancy, here we are talking about teens, so pregnancy is not a concern. But these patients typically are on long-term therapy for nine months, 12 months, sometimes even one and a half years. And they need to be cautioned that these second line anti-androgens are not safe, and therefore the patient should be prescribed effective contraception as well. So these are our drug treatment options. This is from the epoxy POG conclave that we did about three years back. This talks about the different dermatological treatments which are available. As far as the drug treatment which we can offer, there's drospirinone, there's ciproterone acetate, and there are some newer drugs which are also available. But classically, the ciproterone acetate which we've been prescribing for four or five decades works quite well in our patients. The newer molecules like rosperinol are excellent. Patient compliance is very good. They can be given for months to years together. And they also have the added benefit that sometimes they can result in about 5 to 10% of weight loss. A few slides about mental health issues. Because this age group is extremely sensitive to, how can I put it, body image, facial appearance, how popular they are, all of these things put together create sometimes a perfect storm. Therefore, there are multiple issues which you and I, as OBGYNs, may not be aware. This is just touching, barely scratching the surface, so to speak. But you can have a wide variety of disorders which can occur in this particular age group. 
because everything that you and I see gets amplified tenfold. If you say that, okay, your physical appearance is not all that bad, you're fine. She'll go back home and for the next two days, she'll be thinking only about that. And you know how that depression spiral starts. And therefore, you need to be able to identify when these patients specifically are at risk of these last two issues, suicide risk and bipolar disorder. And you need to refer these patients immediately to group psychological counseling to a psychiatrist in case you suspect these issues. The other groups of disorders and issues as well could benefit from good psychological counseling. How can you diagnose these? You ask some leading questions, and these are laid out again in the guideline. It's not rocket science, it's just common sense. You know, you need to ensure is that the patient is engaging with you. Look at the affect. Ensure that you ask very simply basic questions, how much time do you spend thinking about these things, etc., etc. And just these simple questions will give you a lot of clues. There are also some leading questions that you can ask, like the scoff tool. So these are all screening tools which are well laid out in the HD guideline. I want to talk a little bit for the next five minutes, the last five minutes of this talk on the recent advances that we need to be aware of. As I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, there is the HDA guideline, which we are expecting the revised guideline anytime now. That's something which we need to incorporate into our practice as soon as it is released. There's also an excellent guideline which is now going to come out in the next month or so. And I had the privilege of working with the group which formulated this guideline. This is our past president, Dr. Durusha, Dr. Madhuri Patel, who is a government council member of ICUG as well, who was there. You'll see me somewhere in the background. There were a lot of other societies also which are part of this discussion, which included the PCS Society, ICMR. Mumbai Society, Endocrine Society, the Dermatology Association, and the Tata Institute of Social Studies. So these are the guidelines for recompensus nigricans. And today it has been found that recompensus nigricans is well known as pathognomonic for PCS. And the presence of AN, as it's called, is actually a direct correlation with metabolic syndrome, which is a consequence, one of the important consequences of the long-term unopposed estrogen which is present in patients with PCS. So AN is very widely seen all over the world, but specifically in Indian population and in dark-skinned populations around the world, the presence of AN is significantly higher. And that's why we put together this guideline. Again, it's expected to be published anytime in the next one month or so. The final finishing touches to this are being put in. Morbid obesity is something which I talk about, but I'm not sure how relevant it is in the adolescent population, but occasionally you will see youngsters who are 100 kilos plus, and then there is a wide range of treatments that you can offer them, but how evidence-based they are and whether you can offer all these difficult-looking surgeries to a youngster is something which I will not be able to comment, but it's something which we need to keep in mind. Therefore, we are going to have some good guidelines, which are the national guidelines, going to be published on obesity, and this will specifically look at the issue of bariatric surgery and also some excellent pharmacotherapy, which is now going to be launched soon in India, specifically something called as GLP-1, glucagon like polypeptide 1. Igonis, which are going to be launched in India very soon, and just to watch out for these guidelines. This is an old slide from 2019, where we did the Foxy Pioneering PCOS Protocols for Practice launch in the Hyderabad Managing Committee meeting. Dr. Nandita Palchetko was the president at that time, and I was chairperson for the Indian Committee. So we developed this seven-step guide in association with the PCS Aware Group. This is an international group. It specifically looked at how we counsel youngsters who have received a diagnosis for the first time, perhaps, of PCOS. It's not rocket science, it's simple, but it looks at everything in a stepwise and proper fashion, and it ensures that all the important concepts are conveyed to your patient, obviously not in one sitting, over a period of time, but that ensures that all the important aspects are touched upon. This is the workflow that came out of the final PCOS meeting, and 
your various different groups after your endocrine evaluation. You look at your androgens. If they are abnormal, then yes, this patient has androgen excess. Then you need to determine whether this androgen excess is PCOS related or it's something else, whether it's an ovarian tumor or an ovarian tumor. And obviously, once you have made a diagnosis of PCOS, then as per the clinical presentation, you tailor make the treatment and decide which particular hormone therapy is most suitable in this young lady. One last paper which I found, which is of recent publication from December 2021. And this is a multicentric trial from Rome in Italy, as well as in Georgia, which is one of the old Soviet republics. This particular paper looked at the treatment of lean PCOS in teenagers and is a comparison between hormonal contraceptives and myomisitol, which is an insulin sensitizer, as you are aware. And they found that in the age group of 13 to 16, the inositols decrease body weight and BMI, even in lean PCOS. And these patients are typically very difficult to treat as you can see in this second particular column here. And in the other group of teenagers, 17 to 19 years, there was significant improvement in the metabolic hormonal parameters as well, which includes your HOMA, IR, SHBG, testosterone, the androgen index, blah, 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 blah. So the key message that they were trying to convey is that insulin sensitizers and exercise, because exercise is the best insulin sensitizer, both seem to work very well even in lean PCOS in the adolescent age group. And this is relevant sometimes because patients, youngsters, their caregivers, the parents, the mother especially, may not want to put an adolescent on an OCPL at such a young age. So they have been explained the benefits of this particular therapy, and that's probably where your insulin sensitizer therapy may help. So to conclude today's talk, ladies and gentlemen, adolescent PCOS is the new hidden pandemic of our times. Irregular cycles, acne, hospitalism, obesity, all of these are very common complaints which come to us, which come even to general practitioners. Appropriate management requires a multidisciplinary approach. Exercise, insulin sensitizers are the mainstay of treatment, should form the pillars of therapy. In carefully selected patients with good counseling, and depending on what is the presenting component of the patient, especially if it's a florid acne or if it's a resistant hospital, then cyclical hormone therapy is now recommended by guidelines. It yields significant benefit in the population. And I'll close by saying that the good physician is the one who treats the disease, but the great physician is the one who treats the patient who has the disease. Always look at the patient as a whole. Don't look at her as somebody who has acne or somebody who has hospitalism. She will even be in the Look at mental health issues, ensure you don't miss out important gotas. And finally, not all androgen excess is equal to her citizen. Remember, there are other causes of her citizen and I think yes. Sir. Thank you so much for a patient hearing. Thank you, Dr. Shobhaguri, for having me here. I hope the internet was not too bad and I was able to cover everything we talked. Yes. So happy I absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, Lakshmi. Yeah, Dr. Mala. Absolutely brilliant presentation, I must say. And again, here, uh, the counseling plays. Uh, excellent scientific deliberation from Dr. Prateek. You have to really counsel these girls right from the very childhood about the importance of exercise and diet. And so that they are really integrated into healthy lifestyle. They have to be understanding that Exercise has a very important role in one's life. It's not only take care of the PCOS, for other health benefits also, exercise and diet has a very good role. And you have nicely said, what is the role of the lifestyle? What is the role of the drugs? And how you have to counsel this patient in the long term for their long lasting health, which will also implicate their future reproductive function as well as the other complications in their life. Thanks. Dr. Pratik, that was a really very informative exploration, excellent uh, deliberation from your side. Yes, uh, Pratik, I am so happy that since AJS, we gynecologists are focusing only on the menstrual part of the PCOS, adolescent PCOS, then we started focusing on acne, hirsutism. 
and then when this recent ishre guidelines came we all started talking about the lifestyle aspect and i'm so happy that we gynecologists start talking about it but what i am impressed is that you touched upon the mental health issues which is a very very important whenever a case of adolescent pcos comes to us but i don't know how much time we are really able to devote to address this mental health issue in adolescent pcos whether we are working in public sector or private sector and for that there are many many i think softwares or these uh, forms which are available on google you all can download it keep it in your reception counter and tell your staff to fill those questionnaires to address the mental health issues of that adolescent pcos so that it will become very easy for you as dr pratik has described what aspect of mental health issue she is concerned with body image depression or other parts of the mental health issue so pratik it was really very very wonderful talk because you gave a comprehensive overview of adolescent pcos including the recent advances and mental health issues correct and once uh, every mother of the adolescent pcos definitely ask you doctor ye theek ho jayega na shaadi ke baad pakka theek ho jayega na to please tell them that we can keep it under control and we cannot cure it because many of our colleagues they are doing this counseling ki shaadi ho jayegi bachcha ho jayega sab theek ho jayega so please don't do this kind of counseling as dr mala was emphasizing just ascertain the importance of lifestyle modification to these teenagers and to their parents as well yeah um, thank you dr lakshmi uh, i know that you also have a special interest in pcos and uh, those inputs were really really very insightful from your side now pratik i had a few queries one is um, uh, all our post graduates are still uh, thinking about hair and syndrome so do we still use the terminology the acronym <clears throat> to my knowledge i have never seen a hair and syndrome in my life and the other causes hyperandrogenism the other causes of hyperandrogenism other than pcos i have seen yes. maybe one which was an adrenal very long ago so if you are working in tertiary care if you are in a teaching hospital if you are attached to a university hospital probably you will see these patients more often if it, especially you are in close liaison with your endocrinology patients in private practice you would rarely see them but the key here is to ensure that you do your biochemical tests at least once when the patient presents to you so that you don't miss these issues after you have treated her with say cyclocalosis for 12 months and then somebody does a biochemical test and figures out that this is something else this is an ovarian tumor which you have not diagnosed you don't want to land up in that kind of situation <clears throat> yeah very true that endocrine the assessment becomes necessary if there is a very florid hyperandrogenic presentation no particularly so hyperandrogenism treatment usually hyperandrogenism is not very responsive to the myoinositol and the lifestyle management uh, so in them i think we need to have fine tuning of long duration of hormonal contraceptives low dose low dose hormones let us say or cyclotron containing um, uh, you know medications let us say so once we start them Uh, how long do you think we can continue that's a very common question that's a very common i think the chairpersons also would like uh, to deliberate on this ki how long can you put them on uh, combined oral contraceptive pills how many years as far as ciproterone acetate the older molecule is concerned we have a huge body of evidence and there are patients who have taken it for years together five years seven years the data is there without any issues whatsoever The uh, issue is of the modern pills, the Yasmin and the Yaz, the Drosperinone. The Drosperinone country. So yes. here we don't have as large a body of evidence, but people have given it for up to two years without any issues. Yeah, I think longer. Really also. fine longer and quite longer. safe, especially yeah. when we are talking about adolescents. Yeah. And for adults, when we are talking about model. contraception, because Cyprotron containing OC pills are actually not FDA approved for contraception. So, uh, if if we have to protect them from pregnancy simultaneously, then we need to put them on drosperinone containing because they give better relief from hyperandrogenism. 
I think Pratik, there is uh, one Pulkita Lamba who has raised her hands. Uh, so can you please unmute and talk, Dr. Pulkita Lamba? Mitali, inko unmute karo. Yeah, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. And uh, Shoba, what Pratik was highlighting, and I would also highlight as far as we gynecologists are concerned, please loosely we should not label them as a case of PCOS. Yes. His recent guidelines they have come out with a very clear criteria when you can label them as a PCOS and PCO-like morphology. These are two different things. But still we see that many gynecologists, they put that label of PCOS and that label carries with that girl for an yes. entire lifetime because the second gynecologist, the third gynecologist, they are just scared or afraid. They don't want to remove that label ki nahi nahi ab PCOS nahi hai. They are just thinking ki aray, kisi ne label kiya hai, hum kyo isko bole ki PCOS nahi hai. So when you are diagnosing at the first time, be very sure that this is really a case of PCOS and not PCOS like morphology. Yes. And most of the radiologists also, they will write yes. PCOS. They are yes. very yes. fond of writing because so in, adolescent, diagnosis. in okay. adolescent girls in India, we are not doing transvaginal scan. We are doing only transabdominal scan, which has got its own inherent limitations as far as diagnosis of PCOS is concerned because we are depending on the ovarian volume. So we should tell, I know the radiologists, they always write, please correlate clinically. So we should correlate clinically and counsel them whether this is actually PCOS or this is not a case of PCOS. So it is with us how to diagnose that particular girl with that uh, presentation. Yes, Pulkida. <laughs> Hello. Chat box me. Ah, can can type the question actually. Hmm. Yeah. That will be uh, very very beneficial. Hmm. Yeah, Doctor Alka Kute, would you like to unmute and uh, hmm. come and uh, respond, please? I mean, would you like to interact? Then we can go to the next session. Yeah. Hello, yeah, Dr. Alka. Yes, yes. Just run there. Uh, Dr. Pratik, excellent lecture as usual. I love Pratik's lecture. They are so scientifically evidence-based and clear-cut messages. Uh, one thing I wanted to highlight, I have written in the chat box. Many times, the radiologists diagnose it and write, please, please co correlate it clinically. And But uh, the poor girl just goes through that report. She is so techno-savvy nowadays. They all know what is PCOS and all those things. But she gets so much mentally depressed. Even if counseling done properly, it takes long time to counsel them. This is not actually PCOS. PCOS like, or it's not PCOS at all, we have to tell. And secondly, I have tried triquilar, low-dose contraceptives in such girls. Triquilar, natural, uh, mimicking natural um, menstrual cycle like. And many right. times, I, yeah, triphasic, yeah. And many times I have seen that after three months, whatever picture was there, it gets cleared. Only thing we had to counsel for lifestyle modification, weight reduction, meditation, prayers, and all that, morning walk and all that. But three months course, like she feels that something is given. Of course, we should not give without any indication. We have to see all those factors because medically we should be correct to advise them. But low dose triphasic contraceptives um, will be helpful at least for three months. And then depends upon the sonography features or follow up of the uh, girl. I think so. Yeah. So I think the uh, Pratik, your your talk and as well as Dr. Charmila has brought in a lot of interacting. And uh, thank you so very much. We thank you very much. We shall move on to the next uh, chairpersons. Move on to the next session, please. Yeah. Can I have the CVs of the next chairperson? Thanks to Mala and Vidya for having joined. Um, my heartfelt thanks to them for having given their time today evening. I hope you will stay on for the rest of the session because we can have a lot of interaction. It's still to come. Uh, Dr. Kiran Pandey, um, Chairperson of the Medical Education Committee of Foxy and uh, ICOG Governing Council member right now. Um, uh, also is a peer reviewer of Journal of ob has uh, conducted several research projects is richly awarded, of course, um, many awards to her credit. 
she has been a very active foxian and um, uh, they are coming up with another conference in may i think so foxy conference at kanpur uh, principally she is professor and uh, hod department of ops and gyne former hod gsvm medical college kanpur with a long tenure as an undergraduate and postgraduate teacher and examiner so i welcome you dr kiran pande to this webinar thanks for reporting today and the next is dr abharani sinha very very dear friend just like kiran professor in hod obigaini skmc muzaffarpur and uh, i have a very very high regard for all faculty coming from the eastern part because i feel that they are serving the truly underprivileged in that area icog governing council member right now she has been society patna society president and she was the chairperson for kris committee 2013 2017 of course she is also serving the journal as a matter corresponding editor has been an ug and pg teacher very good experience and an examiner as well and a very prolific author so welcome dr abha and i request dr kiran and dr abha to introduce the next speaker one of you uh, dr parag biniwale actually he doesn't need introduction to this gathering but then we have to do what we have to do yeah thank you so much yeah dr kiran oh i can't see dr kiran and abha you can introduce and parak can start okay um so what don't don't waste time i'll, I'll start <laughs> no, my it's presentation it's not a waste of time it's a pleasure <laughs> because uh, parak has been a, a friend for such a long time and he has been such an exemplary foxian and an icogian that uh, i think many many youngsters are inspired by his uh, uh, speaking style and his uh, his work profile parag you are a senior consultant to obigaini at pune postgraduate teacher in unit head at kamla nehru hospital Uh, right now the vice chairperson and we we want to see you as the chairperson in a couple of years of course president of the local menopause society and president of the local obigaini society uh, uh, just the previous year uh, i think he he still holds the post i'm very sorry national joint secretary of ims 2017 18 thank you shobha thank you yeah, thank you yeah and a peer reviewer as well That's and okay. very prolific author thank you parag for accepting to be a speaker today yeah. and the floor is all yours yeah, thank you thank you shobha for those kind words uh good evening i bring greetings from icog and it's indeed a pleasure to be part of the sankalp program which is the brain child of uh, our uh, governing council member dr shobha gudi and of course uh, endorsed by our chairperson dr lakshmi shrikhande in next 15 minutes i'm going to talk about something which all of us always consider an important issue because we are getting more and more adolescents coming to us seeking contraceptive help now before i start the presentation there's a disclaimer we are going to keep the poxo act slightly away uh, because let's focus our discussion on the contraceptive aspect the legal uh, aspects are very very important but uh, as far as today's lecture is concerned i'm just keeping it aside uh, william shakespeare has very nicely described the youth youth is like summer morn age is like winter weather age i abhor thee and youth i adore thee but there are some youth which do tend to create problems for themselves and the recent statistics talks about it so we have the largest adolescent population in the world which is to the tune of 250 million plus and it is estimated that 11.8 million teenage pregnancies occur in our country we also are aware about the sexuality of the adolescents today now many a times we come across a lot of youngsters who come to us with a history of sexual exposure many sometimes they come to us with an unwanted pregnancy or an unplanned pregnancy but it is important that we understand that 78% of females and 85% of males do use contraceptive at the first contact condom being the most popular method amongst the adolescents but still some of them fail to do so and then they land up in an adolescent pregnancy world over it's a challenge our country 
uh, is facing a lot of uh, issues as far as adolescent pregnancy is concerned because we know that especially in the Bimaru states, we do have a lot of young girls becoming pregnant and facing uh, issues related to the childbirth. So this is a little old statistics, but it is still very much relevant today. And uh, we know that more than one fourth of married women belong to the group, uh, belonging to the group of 15 to 24 use some method of contraception. But let's not forget that there's a huge unmet need and almost one fourth of married teenagers are not using any kind of family planning methods. Of course, they do get a lot of information about it, but many a times they fail to do so. And despite great ignorance about women's menstrual cycles, one fourth of contraceptive use by youth is accounted for by traditional methods. And that is the challenge we all face because it is likely that any such method used incorrectly is going to land up in an unwanted pregnancy. The American statistics are also more or less relevant and it is, it is noted that in the youth, uh, almost 28% are currently sexually active. Many of them are using different contraceptives. Condoms is again, one of the most popular ones. Some of them are using patch, short, or even rings. 6% are using uh, intrauterine device or contraceptive implants, but still, there's a huge unmet need of about 12% who are not using any contraceptives. And this is a reality in the Western countries. So leave alone our own country. So 10% of the youth realize the importance of uh, dual protection. And then they have used condoms plus highly effective contraceptive methods. Why it is important for all of us to understand the need for contraception. And here we know that because of unprotected sex sexual intercourse, because of risk-taking behavior, there's a higher incidence of contracting sexually transmitted infections, HIV, AIDS, HBV, et cetera. Unwanted pregnancies many a times result in an unsafe abortion, which endanger life of that young girl. Early childbearing, we all know that is something which leads a lot of challenges during childbirth, not only for the young mother, but even for the child. And early childbearing would lead to reduced opportunities for further education and employment. And this definitely is going to affect the social and cultural development of that particular girl. So why adolescents don't use contraceptive? Now, with a lot of information available, Young people are aware about the need of contraception. They know different methods, but then the, the problem is uh, they often do not think of about using it, especially when the sex is unplanned. So they may not be well prepared to uh, protect themselves in such a moment. And of course, let's not forget alcohol and recreational drugs, which are in fact, adding fuel to the, this fire. Uh, there are certain barriers related to providers. So we as gynecologists should remember this and we have to put our best foot ahead to help the adolescent girl who comes to us seeking contraception. So if the, if the provider is judgmental, the unempathetic attitude is something which really is harmful to the future of this adolescent who's seeking contraception. We tend to differentiate between married and unmarried uh, adolescents. In fact, even girl as, and boy. Let's not forget that communication is the key and we should communicate well with the adolescent in order to provide the necessary service that she desires. And of course, let's not uh, forget to be very, very sensitive to this issue of uh, contraception and unwanted pregnancies. There are, of course, certain barriers which we have to think about from the adolescent's viewpoint and their concerns about confidentiality and parental notification. Of course, in our country, if they come to us with pregnancy, it is prudent that the parental involvement is important or at least a guardian is important. But 
as far as contraceptives are concerned, there's a certain cost involved, which we should keep in mind. The perception about the risk of getting pregnant and effectiveness of contraindications to and pre-initiation evaluation and adverse effects of contraception. So there are a lot of conflicts in their mind as far as different contraceptives are concerned, and that is why they tend not to use a particular contraceptive. There are no knowledge deficit gaps amongst adolescents and the healthcare providers, and this becomes a big barrier uh, to adolescents seeking contraception. If I have to finish this lecture in one slide, I would just say that in general, adolescents are eligible to use any method of contraception. So this is something which all of us have to remember and they should have an access or they must have an access to a variety of contraceptive choices in order to choose uh, a better contraceptive and protect herself from an unwanted pregnancy. So age alone does not constitute a medical reason for denying any method to, con uh, to an adolescent. So when we talk about contraceptive use in adolescent, there are four aspects that we have to remember. First of all, the contraceptive choice, the principal uh, method of contraception a person chooses. So the girl is free to choose whatever she desires. The accuracy of use, so whether the contraceptive method is used correctly and it is uh, our responsibility to teach her to use a particular contraceptive correctly. We should guide her to use the contraceptive consistently. So uh, each and every intercourse is well protected so that she doesn't land up in an unwanted pregnancy and contraceptive switching like changing from one method to the other. And we should make her aware about the risks associated with it if it is not done properly. So before we prescribe, we must keep in mind the social and behavioral issues, the sporadic pattern of intercourse, need to conceal sexual activity and contraceptive use. So this really works well for the adolescent who comes to us seeking contraception. Making choice is important and we must expand the number of method choices offered. So it will definitely improve the satisfaction. There would be increased acceptance and increased prevalence of contraceptive use in order to prevent unwanted pregnancy and even sexually transmitted infections to an extent. So how can we as uh, gynecologists do it? Proper education and counseling is important. So it should be before and at the time of method selection. We must help the adolescent address their specific needs and problems and make informed and voluntary decisions as far as the contraception is concerned. And please let the teenager choose suitable contraceptive she or even he desires to use. So, so what do uh, what to do when adolescent seeks contraception? So first of all, we must clarify the confidentiality policy. We have to ensure the, or we have to uh, tell the adolescent that whatever is discussed in the uh, consulting room remains in the consulting room. So the, there would be a certain elevation in the confidence as far as the adolescent will be concerned. Schedule new contraceptive visit for about 30 to 45 minutes. So giving good amount of time to the adolescent is extremely important. We must review health history with the patient. We've had some uh, excellent lectures about uh, PCOS. So here it is important that we take a good history from the patient, perform a physical examination, height, weight, BP, thyroid, Pelvic examination can be delayed or even pap smear may be advised, but it is not a mandatory thing. We must provide a sample display and handouts about various methods, and we should ensure that contraceptive supplies are well available to the adolescent, especially in the first visit. So it is important that we choose the right contraceptive. The question always comes, which contraceptive is the best? So the contraceptive which meets needs of the adolescent and suits the couple is the best. So we as healthcare providers should not be choosing a contraceptive for the adolescents uh, who come to us. It is they or it is she who decides uh, which contraceptive is to be used. 
So when we talk about uh, various contraceptives, we all are aware about various options, right from COCs to intrauterine devices to, to condoms to rings, fertility awareness methods, and last but not least, emergency contraception. I always start talking about uh, contraceptive choices with uh, this method, which is 100% effective, 100% safe. It protects from STIs and HIVs, and this is nothing but our abstinence. So we should try and promote uh, abstinence as one of the methods. Well, when the adolescent comes to us, we know that she or they have made a choice, but this is one of the ways of counseling making them aware that they should protect themselves uh, from the eventualities of unwanted pregnancies and infections. Fertility awareness-based methods need a lot of precision and control, so the adolescents may not be the right clients to use it. And majority of the times, physicians consider natural family planning methods to be a poor option, and we generally tend to discourage these methods as uh, a regular contraceptive use. Coming to the barriers, and we all are aware about the male condoms. We know that they're easy to use, cheap. Uh, if used correctly, they offer excellent protection, but here the girl or the couple should be made aware that uh, incorrect use may lead to a failure rate of about five to 20, 100 women years. There's an excellent protection from uh, HIV and STIs, but here we must counsel them and guide them as to how carefully the uh, method should be used for better efficacy. Female condoms does require some amount of training for, to the girls, but it is something not very readily available everywhere. Dual protection is something which all of us always talk about uh, when we are discussing with the adolescents. And here we would recommend more than one method in order to prevent unwanted pregnancy and of course, STI and HIVs. Uh, there are certain reality checks as far as the dual protection is concerned. And there are some doubts in the minds of the adolescent uh, about using two methods simultaneously, but here, we should make them aware that efforts to encourage dual use have not yielded promising results, but still it is worthwhile taking a call about uh, using two methods. And here, emergency contraception is very much relevant and should be made aware uh, about this method. Oral contraceptive pills, a lot has been already talked about, but here we must try and overcome the barriers. We should try and highlight non-contraceptive benefits, offer extended and continuous use. And here we should also think about the access and the privacy. And all women can be excellent OCP users if they are uh, counseled very well. Uh, which pill for the adolescent? In fact, no pill is inherently better than the other methods. So you can depending on the adolescent, you can think of a low dose or an ultra dose pill. Generally, there's no difference in the efficacy of 20 micrograms versus 30 micrograms pills as far as the adolescents are concerned. And here we have to be very, very uh, careful about counseling the adolescents about the contraceptive pills because there could be some con confusion about starting instructions and we should uh, give them suitable instructions so that uh, they don't land up in pregnancy. Vaginal ring, an excellent option, not currently available here. So it was something which uh, was an excellent tool as far as privacy was concerned, but it is, let's hope that it comes back to our country and our women will be benefited with them. When we talk about non-contraceptive benefits, we should be talking about a relief from dysmenorrhea, relief from heavy menstrual bleeding, and of course, improvement in the hemoglobin status, acne, pelvic plane, PCOS, PMS, uh, all uh, is taken care of. In fact, uh, it works well as far as the benign breast disease is concerned and prevention of bone loss is concerned. Coming to the intrauterine device, and uh, there was a time, especially uh, in the 80s and even early 90s, when uh, intrauterine devices was a strict no-no for an adolescent. 
we always felt that IUDs would increase PRD and STIs. They would cause infertility. Uh, they can't be used in nulli gravid patients, and they can't be used in women with previous ectopics. So all these misconceptions are now cleared. And when we offer an intrauterine device to a young woman who's less than 20, we have to tell her that there could be slight increase in the chance of expulsion because of nulliparity. We should caution her about the STIs because uh, if the risk, if the sexual behavior is risky, it is not going to prevent sexually transmitted infection in her. But it can be offered to adolescent girls and nulliparous women who desire a long-term reversible contraception. LNG intrauterine device. Um, works wonderfully well. If you look at the literature, it's in fact much better even than a permanent method, though it is approved for use in five years. There are quite a few studies which talk about its use for about seven years. And here we have to cash on the benefits of the LNG intrauterine system, especially for girls who, who have heavy menstrual bleeding and dysmenorrhea and pelvic pain otherwise, of course, it can be certainly used in conditions like fibroids, adenomyosis, or even endometrial hyperplasias. A Depo-Provera one still one of the best options because uh, it is very effective. There are quite a few non-contraceptive benefits and it is almost forgettable where the girl has to return for a shot every three months. There was a concern about the BMD. So this is something which no more is relevant these days. Implanon or a single rod contraceptive uh, implant, which by far probably is the best option. It does suppress ovulation and it thickens the cervical mucus. It is highly effective uh, for three years and it is non-user dependent and needs only one visit. It is very discreet, rapidly reversible, and even it can be used during lactation, especially in adolescent girls who've just delivered. Let's not forget talking about emergency contraception. And of course, we do have, apart from the pills, we do have a copper intrauterine device in our basket as an emergency contraception. But here, we should uh, keep in mind certain issues related to the emergency contraception and the controversy that is always brought about is uh, about promiscuous behavior, whether we are encouraging youngsters uh, by providing them EC to have promiscuous behavior. Of course, you know, there is lack of supervision, over-the-counter availability, and that makes it more acceptable or available for the, for the youngsters. When we talk about adolescent contraception, this is probably an extremely important slide because our counseling has to be non-judgmental. Please note that the counseling has to be unbiased. The adolescent who comes to you has already made a choice. So don't try to teach her morals. Give her good scientific information which would protect her. So we should give her realistic information about the use of contraceptive and the failure associated with it. And we, of course, have to be very, very sensitive to cater to the needs of adolescents. Uh, we should also make them aware about uh, contraceptive failures because that is how they have to report to us in case they miss their periods. And this is one chart which is really important for all of us to keep in ourselves because it will uh, tell us what are the barriers to adherence of methods, uh, different methods to adolescents. And it will also tell us the strategies to increase the adherence in order to protect the adolescent. So to conclude, adolescents are eligible for all contraceptives as adults. Effective contraceptive counseling for adolescents is extremely important. Contraceptive uh, services visit should include relevant history uh, limited role of physical examination, and we should give a lot of information about uh, the, con the different methods and certain guidance about sexual behavior is also important. Uh, abstinence is can be one of the options for contraceptives 
And here we also should remember that provision of contraceptive methods should be offered as per the teenager's choice and education about and provision of EC is effective in reducing uh, unintended pregnancies and abortion. So thank you very much. And once again, thank you Shobha for giving me this opportunity. And of course, thank you Lakshmi for encouraging all of us uh, to do a lot of activities. Thank you. Chairpersons, please. They are not still joined. You are the chairperson. And the chairperson. So and you... Dr. Lakshmi. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Lakshmi, your comments, please. You're muted, I think. So. Yeah. Hello, Parag. It was a wonderful presentation. And you rightly said whenever any adolescent comes to our generation people we automatically uh, start behaving like a parent and we are really prejudiced which we all have to consciously change our mindset as far as this young generation is concerned as you rightly pointed out about pokso act please tell everybody that sexual intercourse below the age of 18 years whether you are married or unmarried is a punishable offense under pokso act that is why Parag has rightly said that disclaimer is here because we are talking about adolescent contraception. But everyone will definitely remember Parag when we were postgraduate students, we used to have one ward where all these teenage pregnancies, uh, the girls, they used to be there and they used to be waiting for their deliveries because it was late diagnosis of this teenage pregnancy. So it is because of awareness, Dr. Shobha, that is why I'm so happy that we are contributing towards this awareness of adolescent and the awareness about contraception that all these teenage pregnancy incidents has really come down. And even if there is unintended pregnancy, they do come early with that pregnancy that we are pregnant, they are able to diagnose. I'm sure there are some abuse uh, of emergency contraception as well. But we are so happy that we are not getting now teenagers who are pregnant with 24 weeks pregnancy, 28 weeks of pregnancy. Yes, still there is so much unmet need for contraception as far as this adolescence is concerned. So Shubha, we have to come out, I think, more and more programs towards this contraception update as far as adolescent is concerned and as far as all the women are concerned. So Parag, excellent, fantastic deliberation. You gave a very comprehensive overview how to counsel, which are the contraceptives. The basket has to be very wide uh, as far as uh, these adolescents are concerned and let them choose. That is very, very important. We should not choose for them. So fantastic presentation, Parag. Very good. Very Thank good. you, Akshman. And I think um, Parag is brilliant with this subject because it is very close to his heart. He has often shared with yes. me that, you know, when I was in the committee, he was very keen that uh, I must do well. He has encouraged me a great deal. Thank you for that, Parag. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Shobha. I, I, I must uh, give uh, credit to two people who are sitting here, Parul Kotadawala and Ashwini Balarao. They were yes. the adolescent committee chairperson. Correct. And Correct. You know, I started working in their committee first before taking over the young talent promotion long long ago yeah we can take dr parul's input at this juncture i saw him last also then i lost him dr. Mm, Parul, I, are you there i also saw him then i also ashwini, ashwini is there yeah dr ashwini ashwini has been interacting in the chat box well and i will be Thank taking you. her input in the i in, request her to be there for the panel also panel means yeah. that interactive session <laughs> yeah 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 yeah, so shall I go ahead and share my screen? and come Yes, yes, please do. Start, yeah. So thank you very much for the opportunity, Dr. Lakshmi. And uh, here goes. Uh, the, the next session will be a crisp one. And I request that uh, all uh, participants, all delegates, whoever wishes to answer to this, uh, the questions that I put across can indicate. And we shall be, you know, uh, asking you to respond and we'll take forward the discussion. So I think with that, let me share my screen and I hope it is seen and here goes. Uh, well, this was a presentation more on, I'm not able to do away with the, I got it. Yeah. 
this was a presentation to do with SRHR for the youth. From inside that, I have dug out some case scenarios which can be discussed today. So I hope I am audible well. And yeah, I have increased my volume. So I will be a little brisk. And uh, you know, it is important for us all to stay connected with na national data uh, in family planning. I think all of us should be very, very aware when we are practicing that uh, what the country has done, what surveys have happened, and uh, what is the NFHS latest data that I think all of us should be aware. So here I bring to you, I hope my slide is visible in its entirety. This is NFHS um, um, 1921. Uh, and, uh, you know, here you can see that uh, urban and rural marriage and fertility rates are there. And the total rate is there. So women aged 20 to 24 years, let us not split the urban rural. Let us look, just look at the total. It is 23%. If you can see total fertility rate, it is around 2 for the country. That is a good news, actually. Um, and if you can see women aged 15 to 19 years, it is 6.8. Okay. And fertility rate, this is 15 to 19 is married or pregnant. Okay. 6.8. But the fertility rate for women aged 15 to 19, because this will include the abortion data as well, is 43%. It's a large number of the, of the you know, cohort. The contraception usage, the total unmet need is 9.4%. And the unmet need for spacing right now is 4%. So it needs to become even lesser for us to give some sense of population stabilization. So this is the marriage and fertility rate of the comparison of 1921 versus 1516. So you can see how we have performed in the past five years. So let us focus here uh, who were married before 18 years. We are addressing this because we are keen to uh, kind of, you know, do away with teenage pregnancy in our community, which is not so easy, but then uh, it, is, it is an evil which is staying with us. Just sorry about that. I'm not able to remove the side box of display, so I can't see the last data. Anyway, let me just take this forward. Uh, 1921 percentage as against 1516. So how have we done? Uh, total fertility rate, that is number of children per woman, you can see that we have improved from 2.2 to 2 percent. Women. 15 to 19 years married or pregnant are 6.8 now as compared to 7.9. So also good, which is good because almost 8% of teen pregnancy was actually a, looked like a very high number, but we have made progress. Adolescent fertility rate is still 43%. Contraception usage has not the total unmet need. When contraception usage goes up, unmet need comes down. So total unmet need 9.4 as against 12.9 and unmet need for spacing again 4 as against 5.7. So we have made, we have improved but let me inform the audience today that entire, ben, uh, the credit for this, the, the, the entire story behind this is has to do with the success of family planning program in the public health system. I'm very sorry to say that much of this four, much of this 9.4 belongs to the private sector. So that is where FOXI comes in, that is where the, the ICOG comes in, and that is where the committee, the Family Welfare Committee comes in. So dear panelists or dear audience, I have assembled some thoughts, please respond freely, etc. This is the usual thing that we tell about. Uh, uh, when we are conducting the, uh, uh, the, the panel. So whenever you have a, a little girl like this sitting across you, so very well groomed, so poised, you know, uh, so updated in digital technology, etc. She will be having this question inside her mind, am I a child or an adult? And it is a fact that sexual activities start before they acquire the knowledge and skills in self-protection. It is very, very true. They are completely unaware of the, of the risk. And they are in a total dilemma because they are, there is a conflict of 
physical changes and emotional growth and there is a rebellion because adult control they resent they want closeness with their peers but they don't like intimacy because they don't like to anybody to be judgmental on them even the boyfriend etc they think a lot about the future but they want to live very intensely in the present they are sexually mature of course hormones are raging inside them but cognitively they are not ready to experience sexuality as a relationship they do not understand that with free sex comes great responsibility and that is where we step in so there has been lot of research in adolescent care the srh care and today there is a wide worldwide acceptance that there are six main platforms for this the, that includes health services that means us that includes school where we can go and support that means laws and policies where we can influence a little communities where we can be part of the m health that means the media and the social marketing also which we can influence to some uh, degree so um do adolescent friendly health centers help in giving better services probably yes so we shall come to this first case she is a girl about 17 year old a wide discharge comes with itching with irritation uh, with painful rash on the labia so how do we go about handling this case do we do a history yes we do an initial examination uh, do we uh, treat her uh, do, do we call the mother and tell her that she look here these are telltale signs of sexual activity or do we counsel her in a non judgmental sensitive way so uh, can any of the panelists come forward about handling sti in a young girl any any responses from the team uh, from the panel will be really welcome because then we can have very good interaction i'll just wait <laughs> for a few seconds more what is different about sexually transmitted infections in the teens uh, can we have any response please or people have stopped listening hello dr ashwini would you like to take this question up i think dr ashwini is not here uh, no, she is here she is here she is here ashwini please unmute mitali unko co-host banao yes ma'am yes ma'am kar diya first time ha dr parul is here parul yes please hello dr parul good evening parul awaaz nahi aa raha aapka dr parul mitali unko unmute karo ashwini madam ka message hai kiya hai ma'am unko unmute acha अश्विनी प्लीज Yeah. So uh, rash usually uh, with the uh, if you have written it, there are vesicles, then it uh, mostly can be because of the herpes infection. Okay. And uh, if it, they are very painful, mm. then usually it is herpes and nothing else. And many times even I have seen in my OPD mm. that the girls who are not married but sexually active, they mm. come with mixed type of infection uh, mm. with candidiasis plus herpes going mm. hand in hand. I have seen in many cases. Okay. Okay. What is your strategy for treatment, Doctor Ashwini? 
so we have uh, ha has have to give our anti oral uh, anti uh, viral uh, oral uh, tablets okay. and also sometimes there is super added bacterial infection so yeah. on the vulva we have to give uh, and uh, uh, you know uh, anti fungal if at all it is anti -fung uh, fungal infection also so the mm -hmm. treatment is usually a combined treatment it is not only for herpes many times as i explained to you it is associated with other infections like fungal infection and trichomoniasis correct correct so we need to treat it one by one or simultaneously whichever way it works and yes then, yes 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 and then keep them on a good follow up and give them counseling for contraception and barrier protection and dual method which we'll come to and then uh, there is this this concept of integrated care for the adolescents uh, we we must bring in some kind of integration uh, with a good counseling service present on the opd floor where we can have an sti clinic parallel to our main clinic so that the there is a little alone time with the counselor where more extensive details of contraceptive methods and protecting from infection can be given to them so integrated care but separate space is better is what we have already always propagated from the uh, family welfare committee i hope that ashwini and many other consultants will agree with this mm, the infections can be more often asymptomatic in adolescents uh, so we need to look for it uh, there is also a fact that adolescents seldom can afford all the screening tests which are currently available uh, they also have a poor care seeking behavior they do not have knowledge and of course they are terrified of examinations they are also terrified of the fact that the parents will come to know integration of sti service delivery with other projects and services has worked in other parts of the world uh, for example adolescent specific case management in clinics with special hours like the government also start tried to start the sneha clinic with special hours built in because adolescents do not like to come to the general opd syphilis and chlamydia screening and sti case management needs to be specialized for them and expansion of social projects and piloting of pharmacies sti free package distribution etc can be part of it so it is a very highly evolved care in some parts of the world so i come to the next case uh, please pay close attention because many of us would have seen cases like this this is a 19 year old unmarried she presents to a maternity unit with high grade of fever for two days there is a lot of uh, you know bleeding off and on for two weeks bleeding per vaginum and she is accompanied by her parents also a further history reveals that she has had two months of pregnancy and a procedure has been done at a center 15 days back the present condition she is of course conscious and oriented but she is severely tachypneic tachycardic hypoxic severe anemia emotionally distressed terrified and an unmarried state of course and you know there has been a need for abortion for her the family is suggested referral to a tertiary center they reluctantly go there but she is found to be in septic ards ventilated in spite of higher antibiotics and in the in, in a course there is a demise in a few hours now who is responsible for this young girl's death she herself her boyfriend or who put her in this situation the primary care provider the one who uh, you know gave her the mtp or uh, conducted the mtp the medical center where it was done or the medical center to which she reported with sepsis uh, where from where she was referred without being given any first aid is the family responsible is the society responsible and is the law responsible for her condition so these are the questions which come up when we find a young girl in this situation obviously there has been a lack of contraception for her a lack of counseling for her so can there be any input on this case from anybody any of the i welcome any comments on this and how how this woman could have been saved at how many levels this uh, you know life could have been uh, salvaged kiran has joined now hello kiran are you there you can see amrita yes 
please. Uh, can anybody uh, respond to this? <laughs> Hello, Kiran ma'am. Hello. I can still hear Parul's voice. Okay. All right. So uh, we we often put the blame on the teenager. Uh, you know the the healthcare service uh, the the hospital finds it very easy to say that they reported late and of course medical legally that will be correct and uh, it will not be difficult to give a death certificate with sepsis on it because i think that, that is very true but it remains that there has been some kind of failure in our health system because of which a young life has been lost and primarily it is because uh, you know, she had lack of awareness about these facts that there can be severe infections that can be that safe abortion services are indeed available. And she could have resorted to, uh, you know, one such center and uh, availed of the service. And also that contraception is very much available on consultation. And uh, there will not be any judgment for unmarried girls to approach. You know, and she's 19 years also. So there has not been any reason for her to feel. Dr. Ashwini, anything you wish to add? Any difference? Yeah, I think, yeah. Uh, Dr. Shobha, it is a total uh, system failure. You know, Correct. we cannot blame one particular uh, person, you know, that uh, even uh, st starting from her parents and her whatever uh, doctors, if at all, sometimes she has gone somewhere. And then uh, wherever she has gone for the MTP, uh, uh, at least she got the um, uh, MTP done. Otherwise, she would have to go to a quack and similar thing would have happened. You know, at least here, MTP was offered to her in a center, good center, I hope. But still, she has developed so many uh, complications. Complications, yeah. Obviously, the quality of care was poor. That's what yes. I was trying to bring home the fact that whatever was done was not optimal. And there were no safety standards. That is the reason this has happened. So we need to understand that there is a lot more to be done. And in our individual practice every day, we must strive for better standards of care for sexual and reproductive health. So the contraception excess programs are actually you know, very hard for the adolescents. So abstinence is the only truly effective means to prevent pregnancy and STD. Yes, that is very true. And I agree with Dr. Parag that we must bring in sometimes the concept of abstinence. And I think that, that those uh, girls who have an early sexual debut also understand the importance of periodic abstinence if they are counseled well. So that is one thing to remember because that is also research-based. <laughs> Contraceptive availability and distribution encourage teens to have promiscuous sex is absolutely untrue. Condom failure rates are very high. Telling teens that they should you know, uh, use condoms gives them a false sense of protection is very false because I think condoms do protect against infection effectively in mo majority of the cases. And it is the responsibility of parents, not school, to inform children about sexuality is false because I think all have an equal responsibility to educate children about sex because today sexual maturity is happening, is happening very early. Um, at 10.5 years, women are, uh, girls are acquiring menarche or 11 years and they are very susceptible, very vulnerable, unless there is good care and good, uh, you know, information and awareness given by the school as well, as well as the family. So I wanted to bring home the fact. Now, this is the common principle used. I think Parag has highlighted it, the gather approach for any girl who comes and asks, um, why sexually active youth do not act, uh, seek contraception? I think... Uh, the audience are well aware that unexplained and unplanned nature of sexual activity will be there often. They go out to parties and they, you know, celebrate something in the middle of the night and they come home very late. So it's all very unplanned. They wouldn't have foreseen that they would have had sex. They will have to have sex. There's lack of information, of course, inability to pay for health care costs, fear and fear of judgment and embarrassment and lack of conf confidentiality. So it is an entire 
SRH package that need, we need to keep ready in our clinics. Now about emergency contraception, we can give them this counseling, but we also need to tell them that it does not protect against STI. And we also need to give them the option for regular ongoing contraception. And uh, EC is something should always be offered to those who have had coerced sex and they have reported to us. And we need to educate them on the plus and minus of emergency contraception. And I think the previous speaker has already said that all these methods can be offered. And when we speak of dual method, we often think that it's only the barrier along with some ongoing method. But there are always girls who will refuse to take up the ongoing method of pill or devices, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But they might agree to condoms well because that is the commonest thing that they know. And then we can offer that as the primary method of pregnancy and STD prevention. And in case there is a problem with the condom, the emergency contraception education should be provided. So barrier plus EC also can be a dual method. This is something we need to learn. What about IUCD? I think Dr. Parag said very aptly that uh, it can be provided to the teens. And Dr. Ashwini brought out the fact that if we can have frameless IUDs, it will be good. So whoever has a hesitation to provide IUDs to teenagers, please remember answer to these questions. If she's sexually active, yes. Will she opt for termination of pregnancy? If she falls pregnant, yes. Is she eligible for all methods of contraception? Yes, and then therefore she's also eligible for the IUCD because you know it, it makes sense to offer her one of the best methods, which is also a LARP method. Okay, so these are some facts that they are eligible for all contraceptive methods. Counseling is a major challenge and preferably one needs to get trained in counseling adolescents actually, dual protection and unmarried. If they are unmarried, then abstinence can be promoted as a method. Yes, you can add it to the basket of choice. So an 18 year old coming for contraception, how do we approach? Um, I think Parag already said, uh, POXO should be sidestepped, but I would prefer that POXO is verified. Dr. Lakshmi also said the problem with POXO is that awareness is not there. If you can educate the young generation, they are a truly smart generation. So if you can educate them that there is a legal conflict of consensual sex before the age of 18 years, then I think they also will postpone the sexual debut or you know they might see the sense in uh, you know not resorting to sex before they are of age find out about the partner this is crucial because she on verification she might have completed 18 years but on verification of the partner he may be less than 18 years so that also is an offense so if either of the partners are less than 18 years it is an offense advise her do we do this do we advise her to concentrate on her career, forget about the boyfriend, ask her to go and bring parents? Advise, and no, we don't do this. But we do advise barrier and we do offer a screen for STI. We offer low dose OCPs to prevent pregnancy, perhaps amongst others, or we offer her a choice and let her make the choice and explain the use of EC, very important thing. Now, I just wanted to bring in a clinical situation here. This is a young girl and she remembers that her mother, while she gave birth to the younger brother, had a DVT during pregnancy. So will it change the basket of choice that we offer her? Now, this is a very clinical question and maybe anyone can take this if there is an interest. Otherwise, I'll be going ahead with the explanation. So family history of DVT actually does not preclude us from using the combined oral contraceptive pills. If, um, you know, family history, it still remains option two. But yes, the progestin only methods and the copper IUDs, et cetera, including the LNG IUS will be category one. So therefore combined preparations with estrogen will remain two, but they can still be prescribed if the woman chooses and finds it more appropriate. Now, finally, we come to the most important conflict. 18-year-old presents with six weeks pregnancy and asks for an abortion. 
So what is it about POXO that we have to do here? So we need to be aware that there is a good, bad, and ugly side of POXO, but better we know <coughs> all three aspects. Is there any good? Yes, it does provide protection to young girls against sexual assault, etc., and against sexual abuse if the community is very highly aware about it. The best way of informing for MTP and contraception in the sexually active couples are less than 18. It is important to inform the local police authority and the social welfare uh, officers related to that. Make sure that adolescents are aware of POXO. Make sure that the schools and parents are aware about this act. And uh, awareness will definitely help in bringing down the incidents. The important thing to remember is that there is an intersection between POXO and MTP acts and there is an overlap. The MTP act allows registered providers to terminate pregnancies resulting from assault or rape or even, you know, uh, consensual sex before 18. The intersection will, should not create confusion and delay. So there should not be any delay or denial of service of abortion. Only reporting to the local law authority after informing the girl is what is important. There's one important segment which has remained from the discussion and which I think most of us need to become more adept and we need to have more training and we need to have better understanding for the emerging third gender reality in our community. And in this, we, we come across uh, teenagers who are still conflicted about gender identity. We come across transgenders, um, you know, we come across transsexuals, uh, some of them who are desirous of reassignment, and some of them have already undergone sex change, and they all require sexual reproductive health. And I think that gynecologists will be responsible for sexual reproductive health of this third gender as well. And we all need to become better and better at it. There is already a Transgender Protection Act 2019. And that means that our responsibility has become all the more in this segment. So please um, see that we create an inclusive environment. We add that clause in all the forms that we create. We, uh, we need to use an inclusive language for them. Dignity and respect should be at the core confidentiality if they do wish for that most of them do not wish for any secrecy but if they do yes non-discrimination should be our policy we need to train our staff and to be more sensitive and to build a world free of shame free of shame free of secrecy and unwanted genital surgeries because if they reassure them that they can have the gender identity they need then maybe we can dissuade them from changing their genital organs. So at the end, uh, I just want to bring in here, and I, uh, I think that I need to ask everybody whether print media, social media, helplines, will it help in creating more awareness about contraception? And Family Welfare Committee has done this. I think we brought in this chatbot service, which is part of the Facebook page. And even today it is functional and uh, uh, girls can be advised to go on to this because of all of them will be on the Facebook and they can go on to this and uh, ask Tanu for their contraception queries. So we did have some success when we launched it with the Family Welfare Committee. So we need to understand that uh, care for contraception and sexual reproductive health will go a long way towards SDG 5 and towards the SDG attainment in general uh, for gender equality. And when we are providing young girls with every care that we need, we are actually uh, building up SDG 3, 5, and 17, all three. So there is a lot that gynecologists can contribute towards attainment of the sustainable development goals with awareness, acceptance, non-discriminatory approach, non uh, avoid violence, and assure inclusive uh, environment for the young people of our community. Thank you so much for the patient uh, listening. I hope that it was of some benefit. Thank you very, very much. Thank you.
there are a lot of questions yeah yes so after mtp proper follow up yes pooja i can see that amrita bandari primary medical care yes dr samira aluri provision proper counseling medical abortion service proper follow up proper autoclaving of instruments sterile theaters proper education of nurses paramedic yes and uh, third generation ocp contraindicated is what she is telling yes it is category 2 not category 3 and 4 so that was a wonderful audience that i had and uh, dr lakshmi i think we have come to the end of the program for today yes thank you yes great deliberation shubha i am really happy and we will do more and more uh, programs on contraception update yes so still lot needs to be done on these unmet needs of yes. contraception thank you today i am so happy that you focused on the adolescent reproductive health and we covered three main common problems of these adolescents that is pcos abnormal uterine bleeding and contraception well done shubha thank you so much lakshmi thanks so much i think then if uh, if uh, uh, somebody has asked me is asthanu app working yes it is still it is still working you can uh, access it and check it out amrita and you can also ask your patients to do that thank you alka for the appreciation uh, and i think uh, if one one request that i have from all faculty uh, faculty icog and foxy that if you come across your experiences with transgender women because transgender men may not report to us but transgender women still may identify with us and they may come then probably it is better to start recording your experiences and uh, you know whether they still have the uterus whether they are having sex the natural way whether they need contraception make a logbook which i think there is a lot of paucity of data in this field so we can share each other's experience and we can learn better because this is one thing which is so very complex and very poorly understood and it is very it is a very heterogeneous group so uh, no one uh, case will help so let us have a log of cases and i think if we can bring it to the icog forum maybe you know we can do something with that material thank you thank you So thank you, Mitali. You can stop recording, and I think Shobha, we can end the meeting. Yeah. yeah. So yes. uh, yeah, with the formal, yes. Uh, hmm. Alka is saying we should uh, with the recording with prior consent, hiding the. Yeah, yeah. Of course, of course. Yeah. You have course, to, course. with their consent only. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So I must thank again, um, Dr. Lakshmi, for giving me this opportunity, and somehow this is a segment of uh, healthcare. for women where whatever we do it falls short of what needs yes. to be done and uh, it is a like an ocean where we can go on contributing and i request all of you to think about the unmet need of contraception with every woman who walks into your clinic so that no opportunity is missed for giving her the right choice and i am very grateful to the speakers today and i also stand corrected that this time i could not prepare well for this uh, webinar and i gave very short notice to my speakers as well so i'm really apologizing for giving short notice to charmila as well as pratik and uh, farag having said that they their deliberations were so excellent and i'm very grateful i'm grateful to the chairpersons uh, dr mala and dr vidya and i could see kiran's message that she got stuck it is okay kiran it happens to all of us but thank you for remembering to join and thanks again dr lakshmi if you want to say anything we can bind up thank you no no we will meet again next month yeah with your part 2 of adolescent reproductive health so till then bye 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 bye